Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, big call webinar on corporate crime litigation, lesson learned, comparative perspectives, and future pathways. Today, we have uh, the pleasure and the honor of having with, with us a great, uh, um, a great panel of uh, experts coming from everywhere in the world. Some of us, some of them will be uh, here with us at Beacon in Russell Square in London. And most of them, uh, they will be online from different parts of the world. So uh, let me thank them for, uh, for deciding to accepting our invitation. Most of them are part of our new project on uh, corporate crime litigation that is called Global Perspective on Corporate Crime Legal Tactics. Uh, and in this moment, we are, uh, we are working on uh, a comparative analysis of the different possible avenues uh, that are used and they can be used in this kind of litigation around the world. So uh, today we are going to discuss uh, we are going to discuss all the possible avenues, but also we are going to take stock of everything that has already been done in other kind of litigation. So let uh, just give the floor. Uh, let me let me give the floor to our first uh, chair, uh, Nigel Fleming, who is King's Counsel at Essex Thirty Nine Chambers, and is also honorary senior fellow at Bickel. Uh, is going to chair the first panel on uh, an overview of lesson learned from other kinds of litigation. And then there will be uh, Christina Voigt, Professor Christina Voigt, who is a professor at the University of Oslo. He's co she's co-chair at the Paris in uh, Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. And she's also the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. So these are the other two uh, uh, chair of these panels. And now let me give the floor to Nigel Fleming. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, let's get straight into the, uh, the the questions. But first, before I do that, could I just introduce the panelists? But we seem to be 75% present, uh, which is not a bad percentage. But at the moment, we are missing one member of the panel. Let me introduce the two who are physically here with me in, in London and Duncan, who is uh, online. So Duncan Fairgreave is his special subject is product liability. He is a senior research fellow in comparative law and director of the project product liability forum at Bickel. He is also professor of comparative law at the Université de Paris Dauphine in France. He is a leading comparative lawyer with research interests spanning both comparative private and public law with special focus on three specific areas, comparative administrative law, with a particular interest in state liability, comparative law of obligations, in particular product liability of the law of torts, as well as comparative law methodology, uh, the perfect base for the questions uh, that he will be dealing with. Duncan has published many books and articles in leading journals worldwide in both English and French, and I mentioned just two, negligence liability of public authorities and the overreaching title product liability. I was then going to introduce Michael Four, but unless he's joining us on screen and I can't see him, uh, he, he isn't yet here. And so I will jump straight to uh, Dr. Irene Pietro Pali, who is physically here in, in London. Irene is a senior fellow in business and human rights at Bickel. Her main task is to conduct research on corporate rights, due diligence, and other aspects of implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Prior to joining Bickel, he ran worked with international organizations and NGOs in different countries, Europe, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia, in the area of business and human rights. Again, the perfect base for the topics I want her to discuss. She was based in Yangon, Myanmar, where she worked as a business and human rights consultant for both Amnesty International and FIDH. Previously, she was senior research fellow at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and worked for legal programs of ECPAC International in Thailand. She has published regularly in international human rights uh, law journals, books, and newspapers, including Business, Human Rights, and Transitional Justice, published in 2020. Uh, and finally, here in London, Richard Lord, uh, who will be addressing 
commercial litigation aspects of the problem. And I can take his CV also shortly, mainly from his website at Brick, Brick Court Chambers. Uh, the, the reason I can take it shortly is the core of his professional practice has been constant over 25 years of commercial litigation and arbitration with a particular specialization in one of my favorite topics, dry shipping. And if that isn't enough to excite you, also shipbuilding, insurance and reinsurance, commodities, energy and professional negligence claims. Richard is also a mediator and arbitrator and has written books on uh, all the expected topics in those areas. But, and I add, Richard is also chair of the Governance Group of Action for Justice, dedicated to legal action for social justice and public interest litigation. In particular, A4J supports and has produced, part authored by Richard, a climate litigation guide. So those are the panelists who will be dealing with the overall topic uh, of, of this panel, overview of lessons learned from other kinds of litigation. Can I um, pose a question on your behalf to the panelists and, and go first of all to Irene, and if others want to contribute, then that's fine. Uh, Irene, what are the international business and human rights standards relevant for corporate climate litigation? And does existing mandatory human rights due diligence regulation apply to climate change responsibilities of corporations? Irene, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. So I'm actually first speaker <laughs> grade of uh, the panel. So yes, um, first question is about the international stand, international business human rights standard that can be applied to the issue of uh, um, environmental rights in general, specifically climate change. Um, well, at present, at the international level, the international human rights responsibility of corporations are still limited to solve law or voluntary principle, specifically the UN Guiding Principle on Business Human Rights, as well as the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. The UN Guiding Principle that for shorts are refer as UNGP, um, were endorsed in uh, 2011, so 12 years ago, uh, by the UN General Assembly. And what they, um, really the, the breakthrough was that the uh, challenging of the traditional view in international human rights law that only states, only government have international human rights obligation. And with the UN uh, guiding principle and then everything that follow after that, uh, now there is an expectation that uh, corporation also have a responsibility, even if it's not a legal obligation yet in international law, but there is a responsibility to respect um, human rights and the environment in their operation, do no harm. Um, soft law can be anyway a powerful instrument uh, because eventually facilitate the development of uh, uh, hard law of norm that, uh, um, that they consolidate into, into legislation. If over time those principles really become widely accepted and states uh, it's evident the states start treating them as, as a legal obligation, that's what happened with the with the UN Guiding Principle. So they uh, managed to attract broad international consensus because they were uh, negotiated with consensus between government, but also involvement of uh, civil society and, uh, and corporations. And they reflect the agreement on the need for corporations to respect human rights where they operate and exercise human rights due diligence to identify and address the negative impact that they may, may cause in contributing or be linked through uh, by their uh, business relationship. So the UNGP are now influencing legislation at the domestic level as well as the European Union level. Um, and there are a number of uh, laws that I'm going to discuss in a minute to address the second part of the question on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. This legislation is actually going beyond what was originally established by the UN Guiding Principle, because they, um, in 2011, uh, only refer to internationally recognized human rights without any mention to environmental rights, 
and definitely no mention to climate change. Instead, now, uh, reference to environmental rights as well as climate change is included in this new instrument that are uh, being established or are uh, uh, coming up under negotiation at the moment. For example, in the UN draft treaty on business and human rights that is currently under negotiation at the UN, uh, environmental rights and climate change is mentioned and uh, domestic uh, legislation in a number of European countries and at the EU level uh, are establishing mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence for uh, uh, corporation. Also to mention that while still limited, the use and reference in litigation against corporation um, is becoming increasingly common. Um, so as uh, is a well-known case of the milieu defense versus Shell um, is uh, a very important example of how this non-binding instrument can be hardened through the interpretation in domestic law and how do they relate to environmental damaging activities. So just very short because probably most people um, attending know about this case, but uh, um, in uh, 2021, the district court in the Hague ordered Shell to cut its global carbon dioxide emission by 45% by 2030, as compared to the 2018 levels. Uh, so this was is a landmark judgment because it represents the first imposition of a specific of a specific mitigation obligation on a private company over and above reduction target set by existing cap and trade regulation or other governmental mitigation policies. So in interpreting shell duty of care under Dutch tort law, the court referred extensively to international soft law, including the UN guiding principle on business human rights. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, as well as the UN Guiding Principle, were among the uh, 14 grounds upon which the core basis is interpretation of Shell duty of care and, under Dutch law. Um, so the court referred to the UN Guiding Principle as an authoritative and international endorsed soft law instrument and noted also Shell a, a support of the UN Guiding Principle, but also it did point out that uh, due to their universally endorsed content, it was irrelevant whether or not Shell committed to the, to the UN Guiding Principle. So in doing so, the, uh, the, the court showed that uh, he considered the UNGP as the global standard of expected conduct for, uh, for cooperation, establish the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, over and above compliance with national law and regulation. Um, so this judgment also provide guidance as to the climate due diligence responsibility of the Shell Group, distinguishing between the direct emission and indirect emission. And in this way, as the court affirmed the Shell obligation of result to cap the uh, scope one emission, but also refer to Shell uh, best effort or due diligence obligation to reduce, uh, to reduce scope two emission as well as scope three emission, which are the emission produced by the group business relationship. So this distinction really resonates with the distinction in the UN Guiding Principle between the strict responsibility of corporation when they cause or contribute to human rights arms versus the due diligence responsibility that they have to seek to prevent or mitigate human rights impact that they are directly linked to their operation. Um, so uh, the due diligence responsibility uh, to try and influence the conduct of third parties, for example, suppliers, is uh, really explained in the UN Guiding Principle through the concept of leverage. Uh, which can be exercised by the parent company by the means of contractual clauses in supply contract or training, shareholder activists, and, uh, and others. Um, so this um, shell judgment really provides a first authority attempt to clarify the climate due diligence responsibility of a carbon major through um, a holistic interpretation that builds on the UNGP, on the Paris Agreement, and climate science. 
Uh, and this implication, of course, will go beyond this case and beyond the territory of the, of the Netherlands. Um, I, uh, should I move to, to the next part of the question? Or, uh, so um, the next part of the question that Nigel asked was about the, um, whether the obligation in uh, uh, existing mandatory human right due diligence legislation that is uh, uh, currently uh, in some European countries cover also climate change responsibility. Um, so we are seeing uh, in the past few years a, a, a movement from, from an expansion of corporate human rights responsibility to also include environmental res responsibility. So several um, jurisdictions uh, in Europe are ado have adopted or are in the process of adopting regulatory instruments that translate into binding obligation the principle of human rights due diligence and it now include climate change responsibility. Um, just two weeks ago, um, the European Parliament Legal Affairs Committee uh, has adopted its position on the European Union uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which was uh, formally proposed by the European Commission uh, last year in February 2022. Um, so this, this uh, um, position of the European Parliament is a significant step forward um, from, the, from the proposal ensuring mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence across now the full value chain. And it does include uh, several important improvement from, from the proposal. For example, more companies, um, if this text is adopted, will be liable for uh, impact on human rights and environment. Uh, companies will be required to evaluate their value chain partner when carry out due diligence. And this should include not just the supplier, but also activities related to sale, distribution, and transport. Also, the European Parliament extended the application of the new rule compared to the, to the Commission proposal to include um, more companies, to include European-based companies with more than 250 employees and a worldwide turnover higher than 40 million euro. And the rules will also apply to non-European companies with a turnover higher than 150 million euro if at least 40 million euro is generated in the EU. There is also more uh, in terms of supervision and sanction because non-compliant company will be liable for damages. Uh, EU member states will have to establish supervisory authority with the power to impose sanctions. Uh, the European Parliament suggests uh, fines to be at least 5% of the net worldwide turnover and also a ban for non-compliant third country companies from public procurement. There is also uh, a point on fighting climate change. A company will have to engage with people affected by their action, including human rights defenders and human rights activists, and introduce a grievance mechanism to monitor the effectiveness of uh, due diligence policy. And specifically to help combat climate change, all company director will be obliged to implement a transition plan compatible with a global warning limit of uh, 1.5 uh, degree uh, Celsius. A um, director of companies with over 1,000 employees will be directly responsible for this step which in turn will, uh, will affect variable parts of their pay, uh, such as bonuses, for example. Um, and uh, at the moment, a number of countries, as I mentioned, in Europe have already established uh, legislation mandating human rights and environmental due diligence uh, for corporation in slightly different form. Um, for example, France was the, the first uh, passing in 2017 a corporate duty of vigilance law mandating certain large French uh, company to respect for human rights and environment. Um, and it established uh, a legally binding obligation for parent company to identify, prevent, mitigate human rights and environmental impact resulting from their own activities and from the operation of uh, companies under their control. Um, the, there was immediately after um, a, a case uh, filed in uh, January 2020 
uh, against uh, Total, and I think uh, somebody is going to discuss in detail this case later, so I, I don't want to spend much time, but just to mention that uh, uh, several NGO in French uh, and local authority filed this lawsuit against Total based on this duty of vigilance law in an attempt to, to force the company to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission. And uh, they allege that Total did not include enough detailed information in its vigilance plans to reduce this emission. The case is ongoing. Um, Total, of course, declared that uh, the plan does comply with the vigilance law. Um, and the latest on this is the last February um, and the NGOs and the local authority ask the court to implement provisional measures against Total while the outcome of the case is still pending. So specifically, they want the court to institute measures requiring Total to suspend any new oil and gas uh, project and implement measures to reduce emission to conform to the Paris Agreement. Um, the, the latest uh, law uh, in terms of corporate mandatory human rights duties to come up was uh, just in January with the new German Supply Chain Act uh, coming into force. And this obliged German company to identify an account for the impact on human rights across uh, overseas direct suppliers and when necessary also indirect suppliers. Uh, environmental obligations uh, are mentioned but are limited to three conventions ratified by Germany aimed at protecting health, um, while biodiversity loss and climate change are not specifically covered. And instead, a general clause relating to environmental damage is, uh, is needed. Uh, so just to conclude, we are, we are going to see more and more of this legislation coming up in, U in Europe as uh, other countries have uh, similar law under negotiation. And once the European Union uh, directive will come in into force, which is probably going to be towards the end of this year, member states will have two years to then uh, implement it. So we will see this existing law possibly be amended and new similar law coming up in other countries in, in Europe, opening up also for possible climate change uh, litigation. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Irene. Uh, um, thank you very much. Be before asking Duncan, Duncan, just to warn you, I'm going to ask you to uh, just say a few words on the relevance of comparative law and analogous cases in this area. But returning to the topic of referring to other kinds of litigation. I'm going to ask Richard Lord to consider two specific areas which have been uh, mentioned a few times now uh, in, in uh, cases and also in academic journals. So what are the similarities, Richard, or otherwise, of first of all, tobacco uh, litigation, and then secondly, industrial disease litigation, specifically, my particular concern on the issue of causation. Right. Uh, thank you, Nigel, and um, good afternoon to everyone. And if I'm allowed to go immediately off the track of the question, just picking up a couple of things from Irene's, I think, very relevant, important presentation in terms of lessons I've learned given my background as a commercial litigator, which I think are important. And the first is that as a commercial litigator, I used to think that soft law wasn't really relevant. It was just something nice and fluffy that was out there, but really not for lawyers, proper lawyers. And I've learned that that is completely misconceived, at least in the field of climate change, and that soft law is very important um, in all sorts of ways that I won't go into, particularly as I'm not even supposed to be talking about this, but as benchmarks for duties of care and standards of care and so on. Um, and the second point, again, from my background, is the importance of looking at these issues, both from a rights issue and what I just call, as a tort lawyer, the wrongs issue. And Actually, a lot of human rights litigation in, against companies isn't based on human rights at all. It's based on tort. But the two really interact and come in together. And as one sees in the Shell case, other cases, 
it's this synthesis of legal approaches that is so important and interesting in corporate accountability. Um, well, I'll now turn briefly to the question I was asked rather than the one I wasn't. Um, and well, it's a very big topic and many distinguished commentators have um, written and talked on this. In summary, I'd say that both with tobacco and industrial disease or asbestos, there are definitely lessons to be learned, definitely parallels, but they tend to be overstated in my view. Um, one of the things that is perhaps striking to me is time scale. So if one looks very briefly at the overview of the tobacco litigation in North America, once in the early 50s, the link uh, between smoking and cancer was made. Immediately, one got private lawsuits, and I'm told there were some 800 of them in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and all of them were unsuccessful. And they were dismissed, first of all, on the grounds of foreseeability. No one could foresee that if you're going to produce a cigarette, it would give someone cancer, even if that was then the science. Then on terms of voluntary assumption of risk, these smokers knew the risks and uh, decided to smoke. And then on question of traceability for people who smoke lots of different things and so on. And so for whatever it was, 30 years, these cases were being brought and they were consistently lost. Then in brief, the states came involved and they said, well, we're not, we're going to sue actually for the costs of the Medicare on an aggregate basis. Uh, and uh, prompted partly by that, Canada introduced legislation that allowed recovery. Uh, and then as more and more evidence came out, not only of the risks, but of the tobacco company's knowledge of the risks and the misinformation when it learns about the risk, the momentum grew and there was the famous um, master settlement agreement, nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars with the states and then uh, 10 years or eight years later in 2006, the um, famous judgment in the cause of action by the DOJ under RICO uh, directed at showing as was is established that the tobacco companies had effectively knowingly deceived people. The point I make is this, if you look at um, climate change, I'm not saying I was the first to talk about this subject, and there are others in the room, and particularly I think Michael probably before me, but I remember talking first about this in February 2003, so only just over 20 years ago, and I was greeted with the idea as I was someone from outer space talking about the possibility that there could be any connection between climate change and legal liability. And so if one looks, one sometimes thinks the development of the law is slow, but uh, in time scale, things have moved very fast. Um, uh, and at the moment, there's no sign in um, that abating. And, and so although it's far too early to say that this will have a parallel in terms of tobacco, things have moved very fast in terms of concepts of legal liability. Well, a brief comparison, perhaps some obvious points, but differences with tobacco, uh, all in sort of bullet point form, but tobacco is less obviously useful than fossil fuels. And of course the fossil fuel producers have said, well, we need to produce fossil fuels. They make the world go round and there's demand for it, which we're satisfying. And there are many arguments to counter that, but that same argument couldn't really be made with tobacco. And by the same token, the damage from tobacco is much more direct, not, a, a, not a, 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 um, ignoring the causation angles. The effects are more obvious and they're confined, even leaving aside secondary and pastoral of smoking. So in summary, on a sort of product liability basis, you've got a small base of manufacturers of the product making it with the only object of it being smoked by the smokers and it was the smoker subject to the passive smoking point who suffered the damage and the damage wasn't just some ephemeral economic damage slight change but it was obviously very serious 
physical illness or death. Uh, and that is very different from the complexities um, uh, involved in corporate accountability on climate change. Uh, and similarly, certainly in uh, the state's action on tobacco, there weren't the same problems with traceability because they looked at causation on an aggregate basis. And they could say, well, the cost to us of dealing with tobacco is on a statistical basis X, and it was much harder for the defendants to run arguments against that. Um, well, moving, and, and there are many more, and these have been analyzed in a lot of learned articles. Well, some similarities. First of all, in both cases, one's looking at a product that initially and for many years was considered harmless and beneficial. Tobacco harmless and beneficial in the sense that it was relaxing and something that people enjoyed doing. And again, with both, one sees a change in public and social attitude, partly based, of course, on increasing scientific knowledge, but in terms of what one sees as social license um, and the compact between the manufacturer of the tobacco, who were providing a need for people to relax and smoke, and similarly, uh, albeit in a different way, fossil fuel producers or other um, manufacturers, whether of automobiles, cars or others, and a change um, as there is a gradual awareness, not only of evidence of the damage, but knowledge of those who manufacture the products of the risks involved. And allied to that, and very importantly, two factors that do seem of great potential relevance, which is evidence, and I, I'm putting it in a cautious way, some would say very compelling evidence in both cases of a campaign of misinformation to where evidence of deliberately understating risks and the famous book Merchants of Doubt, seeking to cast doubt on what would in most contexts be seen as an overwhelming scientific consensus. And of course, I don't need to talk just of evidence in climate change uh, in tobacco cases, because that was the very clear finding of Judge Glasser in 2006. Um, but Climate litigation has featured not only the traditional sort of negligence and nuisance um, action, uh, cause of action, but uh, recently uh, and significantly allegations of knowledge and either suppression of the evidence or presenting of misleading evidence or the financing of um, science or media campaigns known to be inaccurate in order to continue to justify the production. And we've got echoes of many climate actions now going on greenwashing or presentation of information. And Total has been recently subject to a greenwashing action, I think, in uh, and, and there are lots of them about. Um, then Similarity in traceability, when you've got individual claimants, um, and they may be actual human individuals, or they may be corporations or municipalities, um, this question of showing a causal connection sufficient uh, to found legal liability between the actions of the defendants and damage caused by the claimant. Although there's the added um, complexity in climate change in that you've perhaps got, in simple terms, a two-stage process. Do the defendant's actions cause or contribute to climate change? And does climate change cause or contribute to the damage, whether it's long-term flooding, sea level rise, extreme weather events, or so on? Um, and that allows me to uh, move into the second point, industrial disease. And particularly, and even after saying it for 20 years, I can't usually pronounce it, but mesothelioma. Yep, I think I got it right. And the 
certainly what first got me as a tort lawyer interested in this subject was a case called Fairchild and Glenhaven, which was dealing with the problem of how you could make companies liable either jointly or severally when it was clear that the claimant had suffered uh, damage um, from inhalation of asbestos fibers and that it was caused by one of the five defendants but you couldn't prove which one and in that very specialized circumstance there was uh, a finding that you could use causation tests based on material increase in risk and that was potentially very important because in both in tort and in other types of law there is very often a threshold test where you've got to show at least a but for test and possibly more than that but for may not be sufficient it's got to be a material causal impact um and that was, and of course still is to some extent, seen as a real problem. How can you show that someone who at most might be, even post Rick Heady's work, are liable for three or 5% of global emissions, be said to be responsible for some damage caused by a fisherman in Bangladesh or a municipality in California? And I remember, and seeing Michael there up on the screen, I remember reading an article I think he wrote in about 2011 that was probably in, called something like, can a camel go through the eye of the needle? But the point of it was in the wake of all the challenges to jurisdiction um, on the first wave of tort litigation, he was saying, well, even if you get through the jurisdiction, can you satisfy causation? And I think what's really been interesting in the industrial disease cases is that they have opened the way to use of statistics, to use of increase in risk of getting the disease, to allow recovery in certain tort cases. And there are all these interesting debates about how it works and whether you can say that a doubling of risk in, uh, amounts to satisfying traditional causation test. I don't believe that's quite comparing apples or not. Um, uh, apples and pears, but, but that's for another day. But in parallel with that, certainly the English law has shown it's very flexible on causation. Uh, and even in things like business interruption insurance, the Supreme Court said, well, it doesn't have to be the but for test. Uh, and there are other threads of jurisprudence, which suggest to me that this attribution and traceability problem may not be as significant as uh, it was thought to be 10 or 15 years ago, and the courts will find solutions to this if they think that liability should be uh, imposed. And there are all sorts of theories, market share in theory from Sindel and Abbott in California and so on. And I think that's been borne out by some of the um, litigation such as Agenda, albeit in a public law context, and Shell, where the arguments by the defendants that they're only responsible for 0.5% um, of emissions um, have been um, rejected. Uh, uh, and of course, there are complexities of tort context. But, but that was the parallel I really wanted to draw with those cases. There's also an interesting um, element on time bar, some of those parallels in time limitation, but talking of time bar, I think I'm probably, Nigel, in breach of my own time limitation. Um, and so I will stop there and hand back the microphone. Thank you, uh, thank you Richard. Um, could I just uh, th throw out one thought on particularly in tobacco litigation and asbestos litigation? Perhaps there is a, not it's much discussed, but I, I would like to see this develop further, that the, the link between those two specific types of litigation where you can see caused harm for individuals uh, to climate change is air pollution, where the cases are being developed uh, that um, failure to control traffic in inner cities leading to chest problems and early death itself is a cause of action. 
Uh, I'm not sure if Duncan is still with us. If, if he is, I was going to ask him to close uh, this first panel, which has taken rather longer than uh, I, I hoped, uh, uh, to just, just, Duncan, if you can just uh, close this panel by dealing with comparative law and the importance and relevance of comparative law and analogous cases, and then we'll move on to the second panel. Thank you very much. And cool. um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, sorry not to be, be able to be with you. My excuse is I'm trying to keep my carbon footprint down. Uh, hence, uh, I'm speaking to you from Paris virtually. Um, the advantage about being going last is you can just agree with everything that has been said before you. Uh, and I, I agree entirely with what Irene said, and uh, very much so as well with what Richard said, because I, I was wanting to say a word about tobacco and asbestos as well. So I can do that rather quickly now, because um, Richard has very elegantly presented that. Um, just a word about comparative law at, an out, at the outset. I think this is an area actually where comparative law is very important and has come into its own. Um, traditionally, comparative law was a, a sort of pursuit of a small group of enthusiasts, a bit like train spotters who you know, look at cases in different jurisdictions and um, and discuss them in a in 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 the abstract, the ivory towers of the world. Um, and that traditional approach to comparative law was shaken up uh, by Sir Basil Marquezinis, about 20, 25, the, the late, the great Basil Marquezinis, about 20 years ago, in a series of books and articles where he said it was very important to use comparative law in a practical way. And I think Basil would have very much um, cited this area as an area where comparative law can be usefully deployed. Um, and I think we see that actually in uh, in a number of the cases, again, the, the Shell case, um, uh, and references across different jurisdictions to those emerging cases. We see that also uh, in the sort of projects that are being developed academically, the project that Livano is leading, where the idea is to bring together learning, uh, cross-border transnational learning, assemble it in a assemble it in a in a way it can be analyzed um, and understood, and in a practical way then used by practitioners um, to um, practically put forward in their own jurisdictions arguments which have been um, used elsewhere and deployed successfully in other jurisdictions. And I think we're seeing that. And there's a whole lot of other uh, projects, the big databases that are, that are being generated and you allow access to these materials in foreign language and different systems, which can be usually deployed, I think, in areas such as that we've touched on already in terms of attribution, causation, linked to um, the scientific evidence, etc. Let me just as a second point, just bounce off, and don't worry, Yvonne, I'm going to be very, very brief, just bounce off one or two points that Richard made, because I think I, I agree with what he said about tobacco mitigation, and I agree with what he said about asbestos mitigation, but I think I'll be I'll take a slightly nuanced approach. I think actually that although it's true Sometimes those similarities have been overemphasized, particularly if one looks at a granular level. For all those reasons that Richard just gave us a minute ago in the sense of the differences, I think if you stand back a little bit from both of those, um, uh, the, those types of litigation, you see actually quite a lot of macro similarities. And I just mentioned just very quickly one or two of those I think are important. One is the public interest litigation nature of those of, of a lot of that litigation. It's tobacco litigation in the US, where tort was being used as, in the words of a of a leading tort lawyer, tort being used as an ombudsman. 
Okay, it's not just about damages, it's about accountability. The tort law, we see that in the climate cases as well. Tort law is, is being suffused with uh, human rights notions, as Richard said, public law notion is be, and being used as an accountability mechanism, both in relation obviously to states in those cases, but also in, to, in relation to private uh, actors and corporations as well. And I think that is, uh, we see that in, in a lot of those cases, including the market settlement uh, that, that resulted in, in, in the US. Point two, I think what is interesting is the link between regulation and litigation. Tobacco and asbestos are highly regulated products uh, where there was, a, there was a lot of regulation trying to deal with this issue. Uh, and one, um, one realized that that was not enough. That was not enough, that, that sort of um, uh, preventive regulation was not enough to provide the answer. I think the same in climate change as well. You need a slightly, a slightly um, more pointy stick to actually change behavior uh, and that ombudsman role. And I think damages, liability, uh, claims before the courts allows one to do that and saw how tobacco changed ultimately quite quickly as well because of that. The other point, third point is mass claims as well. These are these are cases where we've got large numbers of claimants. Tobacco is a very good example of that, asbestos to a certain extent as well, where procedural mechanisms had to be dealt with to try and deal with that, that element. And I think that's quite an important aspect of climate change as well, uh, in terms of the way in which the, 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 the procedures uh, can be used. Finally, I think, and I can roll this into two, is the is the, the 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 causation dimension i think that was mentioned by richard and i think again that is important here i think obviously in the in the for all the reasons which have been given in relation to climate change you shouldn't um forget of course in tobacco it wasn't just about the direct tobacco cases tobacco litigation spawned a whole series of cases including the passive smoking cases which I think is a point that Nigel just made a minute ago. There's a, almost the environmental pollution argument in the passive uh, smoking cases came as almost sort of third, second, third generation cases, which were quite interesting as well. And I think they engage actually quite a lot of the, the sort of arguments we're seeing in the air pollution style arguments that Nigel, I think, was referring to, and where you've got problems about causation, problems about uh, attribution as well. Uh, and where some of those were addressed in the um, uh, in Douglas. Final, final point is also private versus public law as well. Of course, the interesting about the asbestos, they weren't just bought, they're not just bought as in the fire child case against private entities, corporations. You see in some jurisdictions, particularly France, a state liability claim as well. In other words, going after the state for failure to regulate asbestos early on despite the knowledge of the risks. And I think that, again, as well, is quite helpful um, for us in this area, because, of course, in the climate change, you see the both, you know, the private, against the private actors and the public sector being brought almost in tandem. And so I, I hope I haven't been too long on, so on, on, on that you. note. Um, and it was great to listen to the other speakers. Thank you, Duncan. And I'll hand straight over to Ivano because I'm, I'm conscious that at least one speaker has to leave very soon. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Thank you very much, Duncan, to introduce this uh, with the comparative perspective. So next speaker is Professor Michael Gerard and you, uh, Andrew Sabin, Professor of Professional Practice. He is, as you know, also the director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change at Columbia University. Uh, our uh, US uh, expert. So, uh, Michael, sorry, I know that you uh, you are going to leave very soon. So I will ask you just a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, what is happening with lawsuits in the US against fossil fuel companies? And in case you still have time, what litigation is happening in the US concerning constitutional rights and climate change? So these are questions for you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Unfortunately, I have exactly four minutes before I have to log off to chair another program. Um, let me share my uh, screen. Um, so as many of you know, we run a, a database that attempts to have all of the climate change litigation in the world. Uh, we have 
uh, as of a year ago, we counted almost 2,000 cases. It's now up to 2,300 cases, of which about 70% are from the United States. In the United States, uh, the uh, great bulk of the litigation uh, is on environmental impact statement, uh, assessment under our National Environmental Policy Act and its state equivalents. A very small percentage are cases against fossil fuel companies for, uh, uh, for uh, money damages. Uh, the first of the major cases in the U.S. was brought in 2004 against an electric, uh, several electric power companies seeking an injunction uh, to require them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The Supreme Court dismissed the lawsuit saying that the Clean Air Act had the sole authority over uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and it was not for the federal courts under federal common law to adjudicate that. Um, there was then another case on money damages that reached a similar result. The courts left uh, for another day the question of whether uh, the state common law could apply. And so we ultimately had 28 lawsuits uh, brought by various states and counties and cities, all of them against fossil fuel companies, all of them seeking money damages for climate change. In all of these cases, the uh, plaintiffs wanted to be, the, the states and cities wanted to be in state court. The defendant oil companies wanted to be in federal court. Uh, for the last six years, we've been in litigation over whether these cases belong in state court or in federal court. Um, the, there have been several appellate decisions uh, on that, all of them saying that it belonged in these cases belonged in state court. Um, the oil companies tried to get in front of the Supreme Court on this issue. Two weeks ago, the Supreme Court decided to deny the request of the oil companies and send these cases back to state court. So this is like a breaking of the dam. And all of these cases are going to go forward. Uh, first, we will see motions to dismiss by the oil companies. Some of them are going to be based on uh, uh, jurisdictional issues of whether the state courts have jurisdiction over the international uh, activities of the uh, of the oil companies. Uh, there are going to be demands for discovery on both sides. There will be motions to stay the discovery uh, pending the disposition of the motions to dismiss. Uh, we may see more lawsuits brought, uh, but uh, this is going to be an extremely active area of litigation in the United States for the next uh, several years. And the litigation may proceed uh, until we get to any of the merits, until we get to the questions of causation and uh, damages and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to leave it there because I have to leave right now to chair another program, but I appreciate uh, uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Very much appreciated. Good Thank luck you. with the next uh, conference. Thank so you. we continue with our um, uh, comparative perspective. I would propose you to go to another uh, Western country. So uh, we go and see the opinion of uh, a sitting judge who is Marc Lemont, who is presiding judge at the Administrative Tribunal of Lyon in France, and is also a member of the French Environmental Authority, and as well as the uh, Arrows Convention Compliance Committee. So he has a very broad perspective on environmental problem. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much for joining us. So my two questions uh, for you are, how, these, how did corporate crime litigation started in France? We know that this is something quite new, but also quite successful comparing to uh, the overview that uh, uh, Michael showed us. On the other side, what are the main legal challenges that we can see in uh, these cases that are coming now? Thank you very much. I, I leave you the floor. Hey, thanks a lot, Ivano. Um, and thanks, thanks a lot for the invitation. I will be brief and but trying to, to highlight the main features of uh, corporate uh, climate change uh, litigation in France. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say, although uh, this is obvious, I think we have to really take that into account, is that uh, bringing in an action against, uh, against a company in the field of uh, climate change is a very complex issue. Uh, 
And I see that from the uh, applications from the uh, NGOs in this context. Um, which are not very, very clear to what they are really seeking. Uh, this is generally uh, true, this complexity uh, in general for climate change uh, cases. But I think that the complexity is higher uh, when uh, challenging states. The first thing is, is that it's very difficult to identify the, the, the precise legal, legal ground on which uh, to, to, to stand. And um, more importantly, and I think it was highlighted in, previous, um, uh, in the previous presentations, but not really um, stated uh, so uh, directly, I think what is really complex in this issue is that we are looking forward looking to future damages, looking for risks. And um, as, as a judge, we are more used to uh, take into account past situations, damages that happened in the past and trying to find uh, remedies for them. So um, this, this creates even more complexity. Uh, I, I want to, 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 to link the current uh, corporate climate change cases in France to um, the, the, their um, history. And I think it's probably true also to, to, to many countries. The NGOs have experienced some successes and failures in past cases, and they are building on, on the basis of these um, past successes and failures. And I think that it is very important for uh, understanding the situation in France to refer to the case, which was the oil spill of the, in the context of the Erika case. This is known as the Commune de Mesquer uh, case that was um, adjudicated in uh, 2008. And uh, in this case, uh, which was very complex and against Total, and in a complex situation where the, uh, there were many actors involved, and Total was not necessarily the easiest actor to uh, challenge in this context. Uh, and uh, the Court de Cassation in France, the Supreme um, Civil Court and the Criminal Court, um, recognized liability of Total Company on the basis of soft law commitments, voluntary commitments made by Total as regard the control of uh, ships. Based on that, uh, this was a very important, um, important case and a, a big success for uh, NGOs and um, other uh, plaintiffs. The very important thing uh, to um, understand that this judgment of 2008 has started the, um, the uh, to put in the in in the, in the landscape in the French landscape this idea of liability for due diligence, and the second very important uh, element in this um, judgment was the development of the concept of ecological damages. Both concepts are currently implemented in law. Uh, the uh, law of, for due diligence that was referred uh, already uh, by previous panelists, uh, adopted in 2017, and um, also for the ecological damage, the modification of the civil code that happened in 2016. Uh, I, for setting up this uh, picture before uh, talking about the current cases, I think that we have also to take into account the uh, main uh, climate change litigation cases that were filed uh, against the French state. Uh, in this case, we had a case um, called Consent, which is well known now, I suppose, uh, that uh, was decided in 2020 and 2021 by the French Conseil d'État, the, the uh, Supreme Administrative Court. And um, 
as recently as yesterday, the uh, French Conseil d'État uh, ordered the um, the um, the state to uh, for, to to continue to find solution, saying that uh, clearly that the uh, case is not solved. So it's putting additional pressure on the uh, French state for uh, more action in uh, against uh, climate change. And there were also another uh, case, Notre Ferratus, uh, which was uh, decided by the uh, Paris First Instance Administrative Court in 2021. Uh, interestingly, the later case was based also on ecological damage, but was something happening following the uh, 28 case um, in uh, for the uh, ACA case. So all these cases have, uh, have set up a kind of landscape for litigation, which now uh, is based on the uh, 2017 law, which is the due diligence law. Ba basically, this is the, uh, the, 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 the main uh, avenue for developing corporate uh, climate change litigation in France. Um, Having said that, I'm not explaining in detail the, the current law. And I think that um, as uh, lawyers uh, looking at the developments of the law uh, uh, is, is very interesting, and but also um, creating a lot of um, legal questions and uh, things to be decided by uh, judges um, uh, as regard the way the law has to be interpreted. The, the total energy uh, case that was uh, already presented uh, briefly uh, was brought in 2020 and is based on the uh, 2017 uh, law. It is, it is complex due to this uh, new legal background. The first, the first um, illustration of that was to, um, to was the challenge of the competent court. Uh, the, the, the question at stake, the first question at stake was uh, who, uh, which tribunal is a, could be in charge of, um, of the case. And it needed to be clarified, but it's just one obstacle on, 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 the, on, on, on the road to uh, the solution. And there will be many, many uh, additional things to, um, to, uh, to clarify. As I said, it's 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 not possible in in two or three minutes to enter in, in much more details. Since I wanted to to highlight some other cases, because this is not the only cases that was brought um, uh, on the basis of the uh, twenty seventeen law, uh, there were a case um, for projects of total energy in uh, Uganda in twenty nineteen. A case uh, in 2019 against ADF, the uh, French electricity company or wind turbine uh, development that was dismissed, uh, showing also the complexity of the, of the case. Uh, another interesting case in this area is in 21, uh, a case concerning um, deforestation in South America linked uh, to marketing of meat by the Casino Group. And um, two uh, more recent cases at uh, the stage of the, the formal notice, so bit, that's before the court, involve, and uh, it's interesting because it involve, um, it involve a bank, the uh, Banque Nationale de Paris, BNP. And uh, the two cases relate to the support of projects leading to deforestation and development of fossil fuels. And just to, to finish, to highlight how complex it is to follow uh, these issues, is that um, today, uh, the uh, bank, BNP, announced that they decided to cease financing of fossil fuel projects. So more or less pushed by this letter uh, by, by this formal notice and the action of uh, NGOs and possibly also the, the, the effect 
of on on the image of a um, company that it, it had there is already an effect of this um, of this case so this is really briefly speaking some um, some elements um and uh, i i think we i will stop here to leave enough time for our panelists because i'm probably uh, we're probably very late thanks a lot thank you very much mark it was a very interesting overview and yes thank you also for this uh, great news this shows also the effect of this kind of litigation uh, on the reality around us so we finish this second panel uh, on a comparative perspectives uh, we'll give the floor to professor chin tian pao uh, thank you tian pao to be here professor chin tian pao is luya professor of law and also is the director of the research institute of environmental law at one university um, which uh, Tian Pao is also part of our uh, core group. It is the national uh, uh, rapporteur for China in our project. So uh, we are really happy that it can, it can be here even at this late time in China. Thank you very much, Tian Bao. Uh, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. The first is related to the kind of context in China where you have some practice of public interest litigation. So my question is how does China's corporate crime litigation benefit from this current practice of public interest litigation and the second one is uh, as as we know now we are starting also discussing that in china what are the main characters of this kind of litigation in china how does this kind of litigation specifically contribute to mitigation and adaptation in um, in china thank you very much the floor is yours uh -huh. uh, uh, as you may have known that in the year of uh, 2014, uh, the China's uh, environmental protection law uh, stipulated the uh, public interest litigation, which entitles NGOs to bring the environmental lawsuit uh, against the polluters. Uh, it opens the door to the climate uh, change litigation in general by uh, recognizing the climate system as a uh, common good and the protect, uh, protecting the public and the collective public uh, climate interests. In the last uh, eight years, the PIL have been increasingly uh, developed in legislation and jurisdiction. I will explain it in more detail in the PIL potential uh, benefits part. Uh, first, the PIL serves the uh, standing uh, issue faced by many other uh, uh, judicial systems. Uh, plaintiffs do not have to prove uh, the uh, at the direct stake in climate uh, crimes. This is quite meaningful in the case of legislative insufficiency on um, climate changes, uh, climate change. Uh, with lack of law, climate interest does not exist or appears inexplicit. And in China, specialized climate change law is undergoing. So PII uh, make up for this temporal uh, vaccine. Uh, secondly, the PIL reduces the proof uh, 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 burden for plaintiff. According to the environmental uh, tort uh, uh, judicial interpretation of the Supreme Court, uh, plaintiffs only need to prepare prime facie evidence, uh, whilst the defendant should measure a uh, burden of proof to uh, exempt the, uh, themselves from the legal liability. Although there are uh, uh, causality difficulties uh, 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 worldwide, the PIL in China with uh, the burden of proof for two sides give some hopes to the plaintiffs who are usually have less powers and the influence is uh, comparative to the uh, uh, greenhouse gases meters. Uh, certainly the uh, uh, PIL uh, smooths the uh, judicial procedure generally uh, by introducing the ex uh, 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 expertise uh, testimony, uh, technical assistance and uh, uh, people uh, 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 juror. Uh, climate change lawsuit refers uh, refer to uh, complex uh, scientific issues. 
uh, both judge and the lit uh, litigation uh, benefits from this procedure arrangement. Uh, what's more, uh, the supporting litigation has been uh, confirmed by the uh, uh, judicial interpretation of the Supreme Court to further enable the plaintiff to, form, to forward the cases which are uh, uh, complicated uh, professionally and uh, uh, realistically. For instance, in the carbon sink cases, uh, research uh, agencies, NGOs, and the science uh, association can uh, present in the court as a co-plaintiff. Uh, instead of procedural benefits, the PIL in chi uh, China, uh, uh, chi Chinese rich uh, practice has expanded to improve substantial law gradually. The typical example is that the court injunction of environmental protection. Uh, for th uh, this end, uh, there have been a practical uh, judicial interpretation on environmental tort in uh, two years ago. The quarter injunction as a, a preventive measure have been uh, developed from the uh, preventive litigation program of the Supreme People's Prosecutorate. In practice, it has been applied in anti-pollution uh, cases uh, with a result in a co-benefit in climate uh, change mitigation. So this is the uh, general uh, feedback to your uh, first question. So as to the second one, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, characters of the uh, corporate uh, climate litigation in China. Uh, we can find the several uh, features as follow. Uh, it, the, the corporate uh, climate litigation cover both public and the private interest litigation. In broad uh, legal framework of environmental protection uh, and natural resources management, um, public interest uh, cl uh, uh, climate case dominates. This is uh, particularly true in the carbon sink cases, which highlights the uh, uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, in the area of carbon emission treating, the private interest litigation dealing with the traditional contractual and civil uh, disputes works necessarily. Uh, the uh, coverage of the corporate uh, uh, climate litigation is broadened, uh, varying from the industrial emission reduction to financial greening improvement and low carbon uh, consumption in enhancement. The, uh, the enact uh, of the civil code uh, promotes this in a large degree. Uh, in nature, the corporate climate litigation target for not only loss and damage have been made, but also the, the potential uh, risks. And uh, uh, the prosecutor rate uh, plays an increasing uh, important role in, uh, in corporate climate litigation as both plaintiff and the litigation supporters. Uh, their involvement in the civil PR, uh, PRL cases endorses the public climate interest duty. Moreover, uh, along with the legal advances and environmental rights, such as the right to know, the corporates are obli obli obliged with the strange and explicit environmental uh, uh, information disclosure requirement. Uh, Prosecutors as a powerful and the due uh, supervisor is more likely to uh, effectively uh, monitor, mon uh, monitor the uh, carbon emission at the company level. Uh, lastly, the uh, corporate uh, climate litigation in China uh, cover both mitigation and adaptation. As mentioned above, the climate risks has been uh, considered in the current uh, uh, cases. Those cases have been mostly uh, good effects, but not limited to climate change adaptation. Both the legis legislative and the judicial efforts uh, contribute to, to this. Uh, for example, uh, China's Supreme Court's uh, judicial interpretation have confirmed that uh, sig uh, significant risks are aimed by the PIL. Currently, there are intensively lawmaking adaptation concerned areas like uh, uh, wetland, uh, the uh, big rivers, uh, water origins. At the same time, China uh, takes a comprehensive 
and a, 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 a synergic uh, approach in negotiation and implementation of MEAs, uh, such as a CBD, UNCLOS, Basel Convention, and the UNCCD. So legal basis for the climate adaptation is enhanced. So in practice, the preventive litigation provides useful tool uh, in the corporate uh, climate adaptation lawsuits. Yeah, that's my uh, 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 short uh, feedback to your questions, if I know. Thank you very much, uh, Tianpao. Uh, it was really interesting and also that's perfect because uh, it closed uh, this comparative session. It also shows a little bit what are uh, the interesting perspective of this kind of litigation. China might be absolutely one of the, uh, the place where we will see some interesting innovation and some interesting kind of cases. So, uh, on corporate climate litigation. I just immediately give the floor because time is really <laughs> running out. So I hand the floor to uh, Professor Christina Voigt who is chairing the last panel on future pathways. I just want to add something since we are really uh, going toward the end of this uh, event. We'll say that all the questions that we are receiving in the chat, you can keep asking, will be asked, uh, answer later. We are going to publish an event report and we are going to also reply to this question. So everybody will be satisfied. I really sorry, but as uh, usual, we are trying to, yeah. Yeah, we are trying to to to, to give to give a space to everyone to explain well uh, our. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ivano. Um, very briefly, how much time do we have left? Let me know, please. You can use as much time as you want. Just for oh. the speakers, maybe just keep uh, five minutes each of you uh, for, yeah, for all I, questions you ask. my schedule says we have eight minutes left but okay i, yeah, I won't yeah that's why i i think <laughs> okay. we can have 10 minutes more uh, well, academic minutes. okay thanks good thank you for giving us some flexibility thank you ivano and and thanks everyone for those fantastic interventions um so far so in this last panel we would like to focus partly on comparative uh, perspectives, but primarily on on future pathways. What what are we up to? Where are we moving into? What can we expect uh, in the future when it comes to corporate climate litigation? And we have a, an exciting panel um, that will discuss some of these issues. And we will start with the question of what legal tools, perhaps what other legal tools do we have in our toolbox other than those that were already addressed throughout the discussions today. And we have with us uh, Mathilde uh, Otero Bottonet, if I uh, if I pronounce it correctly, okay. um, who will uh, talk to us again from the French perspective, but more from the perspective of prospects and future issues, and what when what can we expect concerning future judgments um, from France? And without further ado, Mathilde, the floor goes directly to you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, to give a very clear answer to, to this question is not easy because uh, there are several uh, elements to, to take account. I will try to, to be quick. Uh, for instance, concerning the duty of vigilance recognized by uh, French law in our commercial law code, which um, imposes uh, to the parent company to to establish and uh, apply a map of vigilance. I think it is important for the plaintiffs now to remind that what the Court of Paris decided uh, last uh, February in the total energy cases. Uh, it should be recalled that in the judgment, the judge of Paris considers uh, that is not competent to judge in the context of emergency because the duty of vigilance raises difficult questions of uh, understanding. According to the Paris court, the violation of the duty of care must be examined on its merits. This precision of the judge gives, I think, two indications to the plaintiffs. First, it is better, it will be better, or it is better to bring um, um, the action uh, the legal action before the judge of the merits and not uh, before the judge of uh, the emergency. 
Uh, obviously, the problem for the NGOs is that this type of legal actions takes more time and it will be necessary to wait several years to obtain uh, a decision from, uh, from the judge. And secondly, uh, the judge in this uh, decision is very critical about the duty of vigilance. In this case, it should be noted that for having a better understanding of the law, he has called three amicus curiae and asked these experts to explain the meaning of the law. In the future, I think that plaintiffs will therefore have to strengthen their argument regarding the duty of vigilance in order to convince the judge and to explain him uh, the meaning and the scope of the duty, and also to provide, I think, strong um, evidences to show that the defendant has violated the law. And moreover, I believe that climate cases could concern um, a greater diversity of defendants and claimants in the lawsuit. Initially, uh, only Total Energies, the largest French oil company, was sued. Today, lawsuits are also being brought against uh, banks, BNP, for instance, and large food industry groups, such as the group uh, Casino and also Dan. We can, I think, imagine that tomorrow some of other sectors will be concerned in the context also of transnational litigations. For example, uh, the possibility also to take an action against car manufacturers. There have already been three lawsuits in Germany. They failed, but they could inspire French lawyers. And finally, concerning the victims, it is true that in France, for the moment, before the French judicial judge, we can find NGOs and public authorities, municipalities, for instance. But in the future, we could imagine some actions initiated by individuals, children, or merchants based on the violation of human rights. On these points, it will be necessary to pay attention to the decisions that the European Courts of Human Rights will take in the futures. In the Damien Carême case, uh, the European Court will give precisions about the statute of the victim in climate change litigations, and the front judge will be also have the obligation to respect the decisions of uh, the, um, the European Court. Thank you. Uh, uh, Christine. Thank you so much, Mathilde. Thank you for highlighting the issue of the, the duty of vigilance. We've already talked about the, the duty of care as an Emilia defensive case and due diligence, those broader, more flexible legal instruments that now get interpreted and applied to core protectors and interpreted in the light of either uh, um, soft law or, or human rights law, legal elements that are maybe traditionally not directly applicable to them, but get, get drawn into the, the, the normative uh, force through these more, more open-ended uh, uh, concepts. So thank you for highlighting that. Uh, we move over to uh, Annalisa Savaresi. Um, Annalisa will talk about legal changes, uh, legal instruments under the development. We've already heard about the corporate uh, sustainability uh, uh, directive, um, but they are more in the pipeline um, uh, in terms of um, legal changes that are currently on their way that could address the accountability gap that we currently have with regard to corporate accountability for climate uh, damages. Many thanks, Christine and everyone, and I'm really mindful of time, so I'll be brief. Um, many speakers before me have already mentioned the many developments that are taking place in terms of due diligence legislation. And I think we cannot emphasize enough how important this is from a climate perspective, uh, because we can only go so far 
with existing tort law instruments and it's encouraging that some courts are taking the courage to use the tort law mechanisms that are available to us but i think that we really desperately need to move in the direction of greater and better dedicated legislation so due diligence legislation that is being passed all over europe is really important and especially the transnational implications of this legislation are important because there will be nowhere for polluters to hide if we are serious about the transnational implications and application of this legislation um which kind of leads me to talk a little bit about the challenges of these emerging architectures. I know it's depressing because we're talking about an architecture that is emerging and we are already seeing the limits of it, but uh, clearly um, the success of due diligence legislation as it is being conceived in Europe uh, rely on its uh, broad global application. If we don't have that, uh, the chances of this legislation to make a difference globally are limited. So everyone who is watching these lawmaking debates really keep their eyes on the ball and really push for this ambitious legislation to the proposals from the European Parliament to go through as framed. Um, and it's not a matter of wishful thinking. I, I do think that if we are serious about using due diligence as a tool for climate governance. We really have to be ambitious. Uh, we really have to have this global reach of these instruments so that polluters everywhere in the world are impacted by its application and therefore amend their practices. Uh, as long as there are gaps and loopholes in the system, um, we will keep procrastinating the hard decisions that corporate actors have to take. So this sounds like a bit of an advocacy pitch, but I do think that on the back of what has been said, it's very important for us to reflect on the role of lawyers in the context of these debates. Uh, on the one side, there is the challenge to use the tools that we have as effectively as we can. And um, it's really encouraging to see the early case law in France and how it portrays the limitations in the legislation that is being developed so that we learn from those shortcomings in order to do better, uh, do better with the new instruments that are being negotiated. Uh, it's uh, always daunting to be a first mover as France was anyway. Um, because uh, whenever we legislate on a new problem or uh, address a problem that was framed in different ways earlier, we are a, a touching with our hands the limits of lawmaking processes. But this is why sharing lessons and talking amongst us is really important. Um, so um, I, I guess uh, we're all curious to see what's going to happen in, for example, the a lawsuit that has been filed against NI earlier this week. Um, uh, it's a model uh, action like that to file against a, a shell in, in the Netherlands. But I, I also think that litigation against shareholders, uh, such as the one that's been brought in the UK, is really interesting. We are really um, in desperate need to share lessons of what we're learning from these early test pilot cases, but more importantly, we really need to share information about the lawmaking and implementation. So well done in on Bicol and Ivano for leading this um, project because we really need to share um, information and make the most of the opportunities that are before us in terms of both litigation and lawmaking. Yeah, thanks, Annalisa. And and I, it's it's uh, completely right to to say it's taught is not enough. You know, taught can only address a little bit of of the corporate behavior, but regulating, uh, making human rights, environmental aspects mandatory uh, to to corporations is absolutely crucial. And not just that, but also 
along the entire value chain uh, you 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 went there so that also addresses of course everything that happens everywhere else including scope three emissions for example which to this day turned out to be rather difficult to to include in in other legislation uh, and that could be a tool to to address uh, the the entire value change and a chain and the impact uh, that that corporate behavior has along the the entire value chain so thank you for for answering that and it also speaks to one of the questions in the chat that was asking about multinational corporations how to address behavior that happens um extraterritorially or in other other places in the world um thanks uh also Annalisa for reminding us to keep our eyes on the ball and and pushing for the best possible outcome of the current legislative processes um we move on to our third speaker in the panel which I learned is sitting <laughs> physically in in London I was wondering where <laughs> Joyce is but now I see you I'm sorry for <laughs> having to ask but Joyce is working on an issue that of course a lot of climate lawyers and litigants are focusing on and wondering about, and that's the issue of attribution science. And uh, Joyce is able to give us a little bit of in uh, or overview of what attribution science can or maybe cannot deliver in the context of climate litigation. Joyce, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. And uh, being the, the last speaker, I'll try to speed up i think uh, we have uh, almost 10 minutes first time so yeah um so it's uh, uh, on attribution science so I'm a, I'm a climate scientist and i'm a researcher on attribution um so attribution science is basically um a fast uh, it's it's a really fast evolving field of of climate science um we don't consider it new anymore because it's been here for like 20 years now and it's um it's it's history really, really stems from uh one uh one morning when uh, Miles Harlan um looked out of of of, of his door and said uh, the flooding that is happening in Oxford could someone can can we say something about this in terms of um can we link can we demonstrate the link between the impacts or like the the impacts that this flood is going to cause to uh the people who are responsible for uh the greenhouse gases and the warming of the climate and that you'll have to demonstrate that the the warming of the climate is directly responsible for the impacts that are being experienced and uh and from uh from extreme events so um so it's uh now is relatively commonplace really to uh demonstrate the links between climate change and extreme events and their impacts, but it's uh, it's really still a bit difficult to connect the impacts to the human climate change directly. So it's still a bit uh, tricky to say that these particular impacts that we have here that were experienced that uh, that resulted in widespread damages and losses can directly be linked to climate change. And so, with that said, then it's it's really important for climate justice. Um, um it's it, it's i mean climate justice really requires the ev evidence of mitigation adaptation and uh, and and loss and damage but when you see currently um mitigation is relatively well served uh, in 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 the climate uh, literally sort of the climate space and when you want uh, and, and sort of it's in a better position to serve the um the climate litigation debate and it's because we have well established um sort of tools uh, that can uh, track uh, mitigation. So we have like the IPCC task force on greenhouse gases, for example. So, and it's um, it's relative, those, it's relatively easy to, to, to track progress in mitigation and also to set out pledges, uh, for example, in like the national determined contributions. So that is relatively a bit easy. But then when you come to adaptation and loss and damage, where well, I think the big question is and the big debate is, you find that there's not so much information that can support climate litigation on, on, on this side. And um, uh, as you are might aware now, might be aware is we are we with the sort of the um, 
the loss and damage fund that was set out by the uh, by UNFCCC uh, it's really very difficult to, there's so many pitfall, pit, pitfalls in designing uh, eligibility of or for compensation so it, we it's really very hard to determine who gets what and how is that uh, supposed to go so and even with that it's not just on where it goes it's also on who uh, is responsible now for this so it's that can be solved from the mitigation side of things but then on the receiving end it's really very still very difficult and um, to say for sure is that uh, attribution science currently um, uh, uh, really um, underserves the low, low, low income countries. And in, this is because of inadequacies in, in tools, in expertise, in resources, um, in also climate models, not capturing the climate processes because it's very important. Uh, so in, in attribution science, you basically, uh, you have to, to simulate the climate of when, uh, uh, of when we had not started uh, industrial revolution, that and that would be 1850, and and that we have to use models because we don't really have observations of back then. So um, we would really, it would, it would, it you would really do a good job if we have uh, climate models that can uh, adequately simulate the process of the region. So I'm saying uh, basically is yes, that uh, legal um, uh, practices or responsible actions should take this uncertainty into action. But at the same time, uh, really, we have to uh, we have to grow attribution science in every part of the world, and it should really follow like similar principles that are outlined in Paris Agreement for, say, capacity building. Or we could have uh, something like the IPCC task force, which now can solve uh, things to do with adaptation and and loss and damage. And one last thing before I put my mic down, uh, I also wanted to say that there's really the role of enhanced and wider understanding of attribution science in shaping the social superstructure narrative of climate change. And I think um, this, um, these narratives really influence decision making in court. So it, it's, uh, I think, a better understanding of how attribution science works, what that the limitations and how better and how well uh, this field of science can support climate litigation uh, is really important in supporting um, decisions in court. And of course, definitely collaboration between scientists and, and, and experts in policy making would really be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joyce. And that's uh, one of the reasons why you are here on this panel to enhance that collaboration between scientists and lawyers, because we see a parallel development both in science, attribution science, which will help answering questions related to causation, uh, which doesn't have to be uh, sine qua non, there can be other elements. And at the same time, we see the legal development that we've been talking about. It's in parallel, but it's in a constructive parallel. And uh, engagements like this hopefully will cross those two parallel uh, avenues. I think we are at the end of our extended time, Ivano. And with that, uh, I thank the panelists that I had to chair or that had the privilege to chair and give the floor back to you, Ivano. Can I just say the, the last few words? It was always ambitious to think we could cover three panels of speakers in 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, my apologies to all the, the time pressure we've imposed on them. There is so much to say. That's the biggest problem. As uh, Ivano said earlier, the important and helpful questions and comments which we've received from participants will be addressed uh, either in the report on the event or by email. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to all attending online. And finally, to the long suffering Bickel administration, most of whom are now on overtime. What you outside can't see are the faces that I've been watching for the last few minutes and the <laughs> tapping of the watch and the pointing at the camera. Thank you so much for attending. We'll see you on another occasion. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thank you very much, everyone, all the speakers, our wonderful chairs. And uh, really, uh, I'm really sorry about this <laughs> over time. And we will meet very soon. Uh, we'll continue with this project on corporate climate litigation. And uh, we will see soon at Beacon or online, wherever you are. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. <laughs>